Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, several different issues which I think are critical in thinking about this series of disorders. And I say series of disorders because obviously there's a wide spectrum of, uh, of disease and symptoms and such. I think it's important nonetheless that you hold together because if you begin to parse it and think in terms of people with this specific symptom complex or that specific symptom complex, you're not going to have the, the impact that you will have by working together. And I say this uh, as a result of work that I've done in other fields where people have difficulty getting sources. Originally HIV AIDS and autism and obviously chronic fatigue is, is an example where again I think it's very important for you to be together so that you can get the resources that are required to find solutions to problems. Um, the thrust of my own research since the, really the early 1980s has been the discovery of microbes, bacteria, viruses, fungi that are implicated in causing diseases. They may or may not be present at the time the disease is manifest, but they serve as triggers for the immune system to cause the disease is required. During the course of my presentation today, which is some of it will be obscure to some of you, um, but I think obviously this is a very intelligent audience uh, that you didn't need here, um, I hope to be able to have an opportunity at least to eliminate some of the ways in which one can begin to address these sorts of issues as triggers. Uh, obviously, I, I don't do much more than simply serve as the front person for the work that's done by many, many people, uh, and those people are listed here. Uh, and uh, people who are most critical, I think, uh, in addressing the challenges of CFS and in our group are a variety of clinicians whose names will be known to you. They're all based in the U.S. The people who participate in the original XMRP PMLP study, uh, and of course my colleagues at Columbia who are focused on very many aspects, immunological, microbiological, and others. Now, we had a tragedy a few years ago, uh, 2010, 2011. Uh, it was a setback temporarily uh, when XMRV and PMLV were you know, developed and promoted and such. Um, but in retrospect, there's a, there's a silver lining to that cloud and that it drew the attention of many people who are eminent in science. You can think about this, I don't think our organizations would be as far along as they are, although they're not far as they need to be, were it not for the interventions, uh, the, the, you know, the, the spotlight that was shown on the disease and the result of the reputed discovery of these agents that might be causative agents. I think it's worthwhile talking about the way in which scientists like to think about proving the relationship between finding anything and the disease. And there are many different ways in which this is done. Um, the, the first person to really address this in a, in a coherent way was Robert Koch in the 1890s in thinking about tuberculosis. And the principles that were put forward at that point were that you had to find bacterium or virus at that point, we would do much about viruses but presumably viruses as well. In every case of disease, it had to be specific and it had to be able to grow in the laboratory and put it back into an animal and reproduce the signs of disease. But it's going to be very difficult to develop an animal model, I think, for CFS and yeast, particularly when we're talking about things like cognitive dysfunction or as many of the like to call it brain fog. I don't know how long you do that in a mouse. Um, so and we clearly can't wait for the development of such a model. So we have to have alternative approaches. In addition, there are instances where we can't really grow, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, a virus uh, you know, in, in a cell line or a bacterium in a cell line. So what we need to do is to develop alternative strategies for identifying infection. And for the most part, those are genetic, meaning molecular biological, we identify sequences and we put the relationships between those sequences and other sequences that are already known to represent infectious agents. But not everyone who's exposed to an infectious agent is going to come down with that particular disease. There's, so there are host susceptibility factors, and this is why genetics is so critical too. So when we typically begin this sort of work, we make some sort of a link between the presence of bacterium or virus because we're able to culture it, we're able to find the genetic sequence, we're able to find antibodies to it. We see it by electron microscopy or by light microscopy. And that's where the search really begins. 
If we then find that there are many people with the same agent, then that gives us more compelling proof that there's a relationship. If we show that there's a, a response to it, what we call an antibody response to it, that's indicative of recent infection, that's also very helpful. Uh, and if we have a precedent for a similar model with a different virus, but some of a different bacterium but it's related to what we find in human, that's also very helpful. But again, we don't have any such opportunities, I think, with CFSME because there is no really good animal model for the cognitive dysfunction and the depression and all the other things that are associated with this disorder. If, however, we can find a drug or a vaccine or something that mitigates disease or prevents disease by exposure uh, to whatever it is that's the agent, then that would give us clear evidence and would also lead us to some sort of treatment of the medical. And that, of course, is what we're all seeking to do, we're trying to find out why people become ill, what sustains that illness, and what we can do to mitigate or prevent it. Now, I just want to talk about some models by which we can begin to understand ways in which infectious agents can cause dysfunction. I'm also going to give you some examples of intoxications, things that are common in the environment, but which may also, in a genetically susceptible human, result in some sort of disease that would be like um, the ones that concern us here. Several years ago, 30 years ago, remarkably, uh, these two scientists were no longer with us, Rudy Rod and Rudy Kukowski, were the first really to describe antibodies to a virus that they thought was the cause of bipolar disorder, or what was then known as manic depression. Uh, and in what was then the first time that anybody used molecular methods to identify an agent, we identified nucleic acids that were specific for that particular virus, and we reasoned that once we had those in place, it would be relatively straightforward to figure out whether or not it did or did not cause disease. In fact, it took over 20 years to completely eliminate any possibility that this agent was associated with disease. And during that time, there were all sorts of things that people did which were dangerous, misguided, um, and there were all sorts of issues that we want to avoid when we're thinking about this as disorder. Um, whether we're talking about Ebola or we're talking about CFSME, one of the first rules in medicine is primo non care, which means first cause no harm. So we want to make certain that we know what we're doing, so that we talk about clinical trials or anything else, that we have the best possible evidence, that we do studies in a way that's coherent and safe, so that we get to the answers quickly. And that's critical for establishing credibility within the field as well. You want to make certain that you have the best scientists in the world focus on this set of disorders. And to the extent that we're perceived as not pursuing incredible science, we are not going to recruit those people and we are not going to make problems. So we have to be very serious about this as we are and try to make certain that the science is the best. And the organizations represented here today, I think there are evidence of the sort of effort that's not being invested in that way. I first became interested in chronic fatigue syndrome, and I'm not known by that name, when I was contacted by Dan Peterson in the early 1980s to evaluate some of the first patients who were found in incontinibility. Uh, and my next engagement was in the late 1990s when I began working with Brigitte Evengard, who's no longer in this field, but made many contributions to it in looking at the potential for this particular virus called Horner's disease virus that had originally been implicated in these other disorders. We looked at that um, very diligently for a period of two to three years. We found no evidence whatsoever that this virus was implicated, despite the fact that two groups in Japan had said that it caused 50% of chronic fatigue in Japan. Uh, there were all sorts of problems with the assays they did. Very similar to what later happened with XMRV. But what I did say, was many people at that point were talking about psychosomatic issues and such, is I mentioned, and I said this in the discussion, I said, Right, serum regimented activity to BP proteins observed in Swedish CFS patients may reflect infections with related microbial agents that induce carotid activity with BDD protein. The fact that there is binding to a number of other proteins indicates polyclonal B cell activation. So I said, well, one thing is very clear these people have some sort of immunological disorder. And we wrote this paper in 1997, it took two years to get it published. 
because there was a lot of concern about I don't know, the importance of CFS and me in those days. But even then, as I said, really back in the 1990s, I was convinced that this was a biologically based problem. It was not psychological, not to say that there aren't interactions between the brain uh, and the body. The fact is, um, it was bona fide. And then, of course, we then get back to the XMRPT and LV story, uh, which is fast forward, you know, uh, more than 10 years. And I began working with these very distinguished group of colleagues here. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about the XMRV, PMLP story, if anybody wants to do so, but I think we can lay that to rest. XMRV is a virus that was created synthetically as an artifact in a laboratory. It came out of cell lines. It's, it's terrible that this, you know, led to such a waste of resources. But the fact of the matter is, it also drew attention to the problem, and that's the silver lining. Now, why am I going to talk to you about zoonotic diseases? And the reason is that the vast majority of emerging infectious diseases originate in animals. I'm not saying that the key trigger for this disorder originated in animals, but we need to be able to focus in some, to some extent on anything that might be moving back and forth between the animal kingdom and, and human kind. Uh, and we do much of this work, and these are an example of a whole host of things uh, what really pays our bills in the Center for Infection and Immunity for the work that we do day to day is emerging infectious disease research, and that has led to the development of the tools which are critical for the work that we're now undertaking to understand the pathogenesis of CFS and E. And there are an enormous number of new viruses yet to be discovered. This is the way in which we estimated this, working in Bangladesh, chiefly with bats using a standard series of what's known as insects, PCR primer sets, we were able to identify 55 viruses, 50 never seen before, and when we went back and examined what it would take to get a complete picture of what was present just in those bats alone, we were able to then extrapolate to the entire mammal kingdom, and that mammals, the entire kingdom of mammals, realizing that the minimum of 320,000 viruses yet to be discovered. If you had bacteria, it's even larger, and it would cost an enormous amount of money to, to sort this out. But as you can see here, the economic impact for emerging infectious diseases is substantial. Look at SARS, now look at Ebola, look at these other things. All of this work that is now being done to explore gene infectious diseases is helpful to us for chronic diseases as well. The more we understand about bacteria and viruses and fungi and how they cause disease, the better able we will be to mine samples from humans with CFS and E and other disorders to figure out what might be working there, what might be responsible for causing disease. We use a number of different tools to try to investigate uh, what's present within a sample. Some of these are PCR methods that you know for many of you. Sometimes we use high throughput sequencing, increasingly we use high throughput sequencing. And what high throughput sequencing means, what this does, is it allows you to look at every single gene that's present within a sample. So whether it's coming from a human or it's coming from an animal, you're able to see it. And what you do is you compare the sequences that you obtain against the database of sequences, which is derived from all the other work that we're doing in acute and chronic infectious diseases. And then you look for the prevalence of that particular finding in patients with CFSME, possibly parsed by symptom complex, and that then gives you some insight into the role of that agent as a potential candidate for causing disease. The tools uh, for doing this kind of work are becoming uh, ever less expensive and more efficient. I began this work really with Roche 4x4 uh, in 2005. Now we have another uh, agent, another way to find agent using ion torrent, which is basically a pH meter worked up to a sequencer and alumina. And this now allows us to do the kind of work that used to take us years in a matter of months. And we can not only look at bacteria and viruses, but we can also examine markers that might be present in the blood, or in the spinal fluid, or in tissue from people with disease, which gives us insight not only into the mechanism by which the disease might occur, but actual therapeutic targets. So ways in which we might be able to 
say, this particular gene is overexpressed. Perhaps we can find a drug that will adjust or modulate the level of expression of that gene, which can then lead to an intervention which would have therapeutic value. And key to that, of course, is sample collection. In addition to looking at genetic sequences of microorganisms, we're also trying to find some way in which we can evaluate the immunological history of people with various diseases. So by immunological history, I mean what is it somebody might have been exposed to remotely that might then trigger some sort of a, some sort of a response that then results in disease. So putting thinking about Ebola, for example, if you can demonstrate that somebody's been previously exposed to Ebola, then they can safely work with patients with Ebola. If we can find an example of there's a group of patients who have a severe disease, and they then have antibodies that are associated with you know, some infectious agent. You know, maybe these are people with brain fog, maybe the people who don't have brain fog, maybe the people who have a rat disease, people who have night sweats, people who didn't have night sweats. You can begin to put together some sort of a picture that allow things to make sense. So although as a group, when we're seeking funding to do the work we need to do, it's important for us to all work underneath the same tent. When you begin to do the science, you need to begin to think about personalized medicine, ways in which we can address the specific problems of subgroups of people. And if you don't approach the science in that way, you may miss the opportunity to make links that you need to it. Think of cancer as a, as a paradigm. If you go back a hundred years, cancer was cancer. Now we know that different interventions for adenocea in the lung, or testicular cancer, or cervical cancer. They don't all have the same root, they don't have the same solutions, and they're all considered cancer, but there's a single cancer society. And what they do is they focus on getting resources, and that then allows the scientists who need to do the work, and the clinicians who depend on the scientific results, to choose the appropriate strategies for addressing particular problems. So it's important, I think, for you all to work together to develop this. We do, again, the sort of, you know, we do work on emerging infections all over the world. This is an example of how we found out how people were becoming ill with MERS in Saudi Arabia. We implicated cows. You know, people said, what does that have to do with that? Well, the fact of the matter was, no one in the world would have paid for peptide microarray technology to be developed, just as nobody would have paid for cell phone technology to be developed for flat screens and so forth. But had there not been some other cultural need, in this case, much of this stuff is driven by the military and concerns, and this is the sort of the, the peace dividend, if you will, of the war investments that everybody seems to make. And we're exploiting these for your good. Now, this, this vignette is, is shown just to illustrate an important point. This was a uh, condition that was first described in the UK by John Sidenham in the 1600s, it's known as, it's named after him, and the epidemic of Sydney's Korea. And the idea here is that you develop antibodies with very common bacteria. And that antibody then results in this neurological disorder. Not every human exposed to the genetic streptococcus, strep throat, develops this disorder, but people who are genetically predisposed to exaggerated immune disorders do. So what we've done here now is to take a mouse that's part of autoimmunity, which is an STL mouse, and that animal then describes that sort of problem. We then identified what the antibodies in this mouse bound to. We went back in the kids who had this disorder and found that they reacted with the homologous protein, the same protein equivalent in humans as what we found in mice. So although I said early on we tried, you know, there are some caveats to using animal models. There are some ways in which we can use them too. And sometimes what looks like an infectious disease proves not to be. It proves to be an environmental toxin. So this is some work that we did a few years ago looking at people who had an inflammatory process involving the peripheral nerves. So they simply did not. And this is something which some of you either have or know people who have. And what we learned, in fact, was that this was not an infectious disease at all, but it is a result of exposure to central nervous system myelin, the insulating substance that surrounds nerves. And we found this serendipitously, if you can use that term. There were a group of people who were working on preparing pigs, slaughtering them and such. This is an assembly line. The pigs would come in here, and they would be processed. Every place is here, rectangle is where there's a worker. The only people who developed the syndrome were the people who were moving the brains. And we learned, in fact, that what was going on was that 
There had been this introduction of the two methods of collecting the pig brain, which was then sold in the Far East. You can see the eye of the pig, the sound of the pig, and so forth. And they were injecting air at very, very high pressure, which released myelin, which then resulted in antibodies directed against central nervous system, peripheral nervous system myelin, which then induced this disease. So it's important to have an open mind. Although I talk primarily about microbiology, um, it's important to realize that there are many triggers for the immune system. Toxins are key as well. And, and we are quite, you know, um, I don't want to say, uh, I don't know what the correct term would be, We're, we are open-minded about thinking about mechanisms because that's key, I think. We need to let the science drive the observation. Now, not many people talk about fungi in chronic disease, uh, except in patient groups. And I'm sure some of you um, are, you know, are concerned about problems with fungi. And we'll give you an example recently, we call it, where we've shown, in fact, that fungi are critical. So this is a disorder known as Kawasaki disease. It's been with us since the 1960s. And it causes a vasculitis and coronary arteritis. And at one point, it is the most common cause of, uh, of coronary disease, of heart disease in children uh, in, in Japan, and it's still a major problem. And these children are typically treated with something called IVIG, which is an intravenous human serum immunoglobulin, which shuts off the immune response. And people have talked about a wide variety of infectious agents that's potentially linked to Kawasaki disease. None of those succeeded. And then there was a report a couple of years ago suggesting that there would be changes in, uh, in wind patterns um, just prior to the onset of some sort of an outbreak of Kawasaki disease. Um, suggesting that there might be something picked up over China that was then deposited in Japan. So we began looking at sand air that was sampled in specific regions. This then resulted in something which was absolutely transformational in, uh, I think, in the discovery work that we need to do. When samples are present uh, that have very, very low concentrations of the, of the bacterium or the fungus of interest, you can be confounded simply because you don't have the ability to detect something. It's, you know, it's one thing to detect a needle in a haystack. But to detect a single needle in 10 haystacks is impossible. So the idea is, how do you clean things up? So we've been focusing a great deal on our pathogen discovery in ways in which we can help remove host material or other things that would confound our ability to detect these pathogens with present very low concentrations. And what we've learned is that the very tools that we use to do this work, whether it be the plastics or the enzymes, or the, the buffers, or any of the other solutions, are contaminated, not with something that will grow, but with something that will poison the downstream reactions. Methylbacteria is chiefly involved here. So we found ways in which we can eliminate this by using enzymes that cut these bacteria in very small places, pieces so that they don't amplify, and radiation is what we can so that we can eliminate DNA. And this has allowed us to reduce, oops, I'm sorry, the amount of crap here, 73%, down to 4%, which gives you a bona fide, an accurate picture of what's actually present in the sample. And by taking this approach, we learn that in these tropospheric filters that have been collected, that we found candida, as opposed to aspergillus, which was present at the surface. This then resonated with some earlier work showing that candida could, cool, could cause an inflammation of the blood vessels in mice, and that then led to the discovery a little bit later, actually, probably about the same time our paper came out, with the idea that children who had this disorder had antibodies to candida. Now, why is this important? Well, this then allows us, instead of just talking about ways in which we can treat this non specifically, to actually begin to try to eliminate this trigger from these kids so that this is not a problem, and we can then begin to find out which one of these children is prone, why might they be prone as a result of genetic factors or other factors that might trigger this. The other thing that we've been looking at, and I'm now beginning to talk now more about microbiome research, uh, is to look in the environment, just as I said earlier, not only at animals, but also at animals that feed on animals. So these are phlebotomous insects, they're like ticks. Um, so we can look at mosquitoes, we can look at ticks, we can look at bedbugs, and so forth. 
And the notion here is that some people who develop Lyme disease don't recover after an antibiotic treatment. And I'm sure some of you will know people who fall into those categories. And the leading hypothesis has been that these people have some sort of uh, persistent immunological illness as a result of this trigger, or that they may be feigning illness for secondary gain. I'm not saying I subscribe to any of these things. I'm just giving you the litany. Um, uh, and the alternative hypothesis that we wanted to interject is that we might not be treating the appropriate agent. but certainly something to consider. And the only way to do this, because no one has been able to cover anything from these patients, it's not described there, has been to go back into the test, to ask what's in the test, then to make antibody tests, which we can go and use in the patients who have chronic Lyme disease, whatever that means, and see whether or not they're infected with viruses or bacteria that would not be treated appropriately with the antibiotics that are the classical regimen for treatment of Lyme disease. And we're now, we've now discovered a number of different viruses that we're beginning to explore. And I have to be very frank with you in telling you that this is not a, um, a you know, well-conceived hypothesis, although I think it's biologically plausible and it should be explored. Uh, and it's something that we expect will surprise many people when we're finally done. Several years ago, I was asked by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control to try to assess what was happening with the reports of the MMR vaccine and autism in the wake of Andrew Wakefield's uh, work in The Lancet. Um, we were unable to replicate uh, his work, but we were impressed with the fact that children with autism had an increased frequency of gastrointestinal complaints. So we decided to ask how that might come about, and we began studying their gastrointestinal tissues, which led us really into the microbiome research, which I think is critical for thinking about CFS and me. What we learned was that children with autism, uh, not all, but several, had abnormalities in their abilities to process, process complex carbohydrates, disaccharides and polysaccharides, which have to be cleaved to monosaccharides, single sugars, in order to be transported across from the inside of the bowel through the, what's known as the enterocyte, and from there then into the blood. And there were dramatic reductions in the levels in the kids with autism spectrum disorders listed here as ASP for these various enzymes that break down these complex sugars, as well as the molecules that transport them from the inside of the bowel into the blood. That, in turn, resulted in changes in levels of specific bacteria that were present within the gastrointestinal tract. One in particular, Sutterella, which was very interesting, was apparently invasive because it resulted in antibody challenges as well, explaining why some of these kids responded to antibiotics for restrictions of diet or probiotics. And I think over the next several years, as we begin to understand more about the microflora of the gut, not just bacteria, but also fungi and viruses, you will find that there will be an increasing role to play with modulation of the intestinal microflora, which brings us to some of the work that we're now doing. Now, the other thing we learned was that there was another subset of kids within the same group who had decreased levels of other very important proteins, which I'm just talking about now. One of them was called UGT17, and the other is one with three cytochrome uh, enzymes. And these were important because these are the very enzymes that are critical for processing testosterone, nicotine, a whole range of things that are ever more common in the environment as we increasingly depend upon chemicals for preservation of foods, for flame retardants, for all kinds of things. So there are new vulnerabilities that are being uncovered that we didn't see a hundred years ago. Whether this pertains to CFS and me, yet, I don't know, because we haven't done enough research in this area. This is one of the reasons why I think it's important that you focus on persuading your legislatures and your charities to invest accordingly. But I, my prediction is that you will find that there will be a subset that's purely genetic, a subset that will be toxic, a subset that will be microbial, uh, and they will all act through certain final <coughs> pathways to result in the disorder that you recognize in yourselves and in your loved ones. Here's another example of what can be done with microbiome research in the bowel. 
We've been looking at different types of cancer in the bowel. One that's very aggressive and one that's a little less aggressive. The one that's less aggressive is in this area here on the left side of the colon. It's coming down into the rectum. That's classical. And this form here, which is called SIMP, which is a special abnormality that's genetically based. And we find that there are different bacteria that are present in association with those two tumors. And it's important because the ones that are associated with the more aggressive tumor don't produce butyrate. And butyrate is important because it induces cell death, it prevents proliferation of cells, it induces differentiation of cells. So perhaps at some point of colon cancer, we will ultimately learn, as we're beginning to learn a number of diseases, where modulation of fecal flora by using fecal transplants or probiotics will allow us to address these problems. Another example here, we're looking at HIV transmission. Um, people don't talk very much about vaginal microflora. I think it's extremely important. We have a group of women who have been treated with antiretroviral gels. They nonetheless have high levels of inflammatory molecules in vaginal fluids. They're at increased risk for HIV. They too have different types of bacteria in their vaginal flora than women who are less susceptible and have less inflammation. And again, by targeting these bacteria, we can perhaps decrease the risk of infection with HIV. Now, there are a number of brain disorders that are associated with abnormality of the immune system. I showed you an animal model of one using that mouse that was exposed to group A, beta a very common bacterium in the world, but in the inappropriate, unfortunate genetic context results in this autoimmune disorder, but we have narcolepsy and schizophrenia and all sorts of disorders. So this is not unprecedented. And there have been a wide range of viruses and bacteria and fungi and parasites implicated in inducing these immune responses. We can actually replicate some of these findings using not an infectious agent at all, but instead just a product of an infectious agent, like a genetic fragment that's double-stranded, which triggers innate immunity. The innate immune system goes all the way back to insects. Um, or lipopolysaccharide, which is the equivalent in bacterial. And we can then look at MECFS, and we find that there are a whole host of studies now that indicate autoimmunity, at least in some patients with CFS and E, is quite prominent. So there's reason to think that there's going to be something there that we can do at the end by thinking in these terms. We also know that intestinal microbes modulate the immune system. This would, could, can, could be very, very important in finding ways in which we can not only understand the way disorders like MS, or schizophrenia, or autism, or CFS and may be triggered, but how those, that cycle of inflammation might be continued. So this is one of the, so I'm trying to give you the framework for why we think it's important to do that sort of work. We have, we have been funded by a large number of people in the auspices of, um, of the Chronic Fatigue Initiative. It's uh, really the, the major funders for that has been, um, has been um, Glenn Hutchins, and some of you may know. Uh, he had a very specific series of projects he wanted to pursue. We also received some support from the Evans Foundation. Uh, I'll be describing for you now some of that work, although some of you probably know us already. We have a study that comprises 200 cases and 200 controls. This has been added to the cases and controls that we already have from the CFS uh, study that is focused on Nexium, RV, PMLV. We have also been able to look at spinal fluid, and we'll see why that's important in a moment, because I think that that's critical. The clinicians involved with that particular group asked us to evaluate a wide range of viruses and bacteria. Uh, there's a list here of those. Uh, and we have studied those in serum. Uh, and alas, uh, looking at serum, we only found two cases out of 265 where HHV6 was present. And I know that Connie Knox and other people have been very invested in thinking about HHV6. And, uh, and uh, you know, the uh, Jose Montoya stands for this number as well. But my feeling is that some of those are selected populations where people have already been diagnosed with a herpes virus infection, and they wind up in that particular location. And as a result, we have a somewhat higher level. But if you look overall, with all comments across these different 
programs, you don't find a lot of evidence for this, at least in plasma. And that's not to say it won't be present in another body site or in peripheral blood non nuclear cells, which are also circulating in the blood, and that's something, in fact, that we need to use part of microbiome study. With Jose Montoya, we then began to look uh, at plasma uh, again, uh, and here's an example of his work. The other thing that we examined using hybrid sequencing is whether or not there were other viruses that we would find that might be present. Retroviruses proved to be fairly similar, representation in the cases and the controls, and we found a lot of what are known as anelloviruses. Now, typically, anelloviruses, and nobody really knows what they do, anelloviruses are decreased uh, or present in increased concentrations when people are immunosuppressed. What we found here, as you can see, in the cases, 22% had this alpha torque virus versus 41% of controls. And similarly, as you go down through the beta and gamma torque viruses, people with CFSME have lower levels of these viruses, not higher levels. What that means, yet, I can't really tell. So the focus of our research at present now is to begin to try to characterize the gastrointestinal microbiome so that we can understand what bacteria, what fungi, what viruses are present in the key body compartments, the gastrointestinal tract, the vagina, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. We can do metabolomics, identify products of bacteria that might be important in causing dysfunction. We can study the proteins that are present in the blood. We can study the RNAs that are present in the tissues and in blood, so we can get insights into the genetic predisposition to an abnormal response, and we can then begin to link this with functional immunology. Now, the last thing I simply want to say is that, you know, we have a very large group, it's on 60 individuals in the U.S. and many, many more around the world. We focus, and you will chiefly see my name in association with things like Ebola and MERS and SARS and things like this, right? And I am very committed to working with our Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization in addressing those challenges. But I think that the future of microbiology and immunology really rests with understanding the role of microbes and immune responses to microbes and toxicology in chronic diseases. And I've devoted my career to thinking about things like depression, schizophrenia, autism, and more recently, a large focus of our research has been on CFSME, because I think that this is, as I've shown you, you know, since 1997, this was something that we wanted to do. We think the tide is finally changing, and I think it's people like you who are in a position to, you know, to influence your policymakers and say, we want you to address this problem, we're hurting, and so forth. As you all know, within the UK, data fairly similar in the United States, one in 250 to one in 500 people has CFSME. The cost estimates in the United States, and we have to use financial estimates in this case, when it's very, very difficult, is that the direct and indirect expenses associated with CFSME in our country, roughly 320 million people, is in excess of $20 billion per year. So it should be possible to make, I think yours is something like six or seven billion U.S. dollars, which I guess would be, what, four or five million pounds. So I think you can make this argument both on a humanitarian and compassionate basis and on an economic basis. And I would encourage you to do that because that is what succeeded for us with many of these other disorders, whether it's you know, the March of Dimes, polio, or multiple sclerosis society, or Alzheimer's, what have you. You have to be as vocal, you have to be as organized, uh, and you have to be as focused on your mission. Thank you very much.